Muy buenos días. En nombre del Banco Inter. Good morning to all. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we would like to welcome you all to this event, the Inequality Crisis, with the launch of the report. In this event, we'll have the president of the IDB, Luis Alberto Moreno, as well as Marcelo Melendez, chief economist from UNDP, Martin Rama, who's the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank, and Alejandro Wardner, who is the director of the Western Hemisphere Department at the IMF. This event will be conducted in Spanish, and there will be interpretation into English. Click the world icon in the bottom of your screen and select the language. Adelante, señor Parrado. Mr. Prado, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Parrado. I am the Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department at the IDB. On behalf of the IDB, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for this launch of the new publication, which is the Inequality Crisis, Latin America and the Caribbean at a crossroads. The social crisis of COVID-19 has affected human mobility, trade, and financial flows with a negative impact across the Americas and the economies. It's been unprecedented, and the pandemic has also deepened the inequality crisis in the region that is yet to be under control. This inequality crisis is not only one that has to do with income, but also opportunities that ultimately determines our futures. In order to highlight the depth of this challenge that we took on for this report, I would like to share the story of Paula, who is 35. She is married, has three children of school age. And in addition to her, her husband and her children, there are another five people living under the same roof. She works in the informal sector. And before the COVID-19 crisis, of the 10 people living in the home, they earned the amount of $12 per day or two minimum wages. There's been a drop of one third of that wage in this hypothetical situation is not hypothetical at all. Paul is one of the many thousands of people that were part of the surveys that we conducted. And we may not know that her name is Paula, but we know that she exists and that she represents the challenge that many families in the region are facing. The same data from the surveys show that it is three times more likely for someone from a poor household to have lost their job compared to someone from a wealthier household. And income isn't the only factor. Children in wealthier households also have more opportunities than children in Paula's situation. They can study from home and they have better access to computers and to the internet. During a pandemic, someone like Paula struggles to stay at home because she's working in the informal sector. And so they need to leave their homes, which means that they cannot keep the same distancing that is being imposed in the country. They say that this virus can be contracted by anyone, but opportunities, and to be honest, these situations don't develop in the same way for all. Over the last two decades, the region has also, we must say, made a lot of progress with a drop from 42 to 23 percent in poverty and the percentage of the middle class went up to 38 percent. Income inequality decreased in a very encouraging way and the top 10 percent used to earn almost 10 times that of the bottom 10 percent in 2002 and there were improvements in that regard as well. There is also better access to health care and to higher education and university. But as we see in Paula's situation and in other people living in the same situation, these achievements were very fragile. Families want to feel safer in their neighborhoods. They don't simply want education, but also quality education for their children. They don't want to commute for two hours to get to work or to be left out of the digital evolution. They want to live in greener spaces and have community services for comprehensive developments. They want to be treated with dignity when they turn to a window for assistance. This pandemic has struck very hard. And it's very likely that we'll come out of this crisis with more inequality. This is why today we are very proud to present this report that is more necessary and timely than ever. This report puts on the table of the different dimensions of this inequality. This is a very ambitious report, given that it is one that has taken a deep analysis and exhaustive take on the economic policies that should be followed by our countries to come out of this crisis and to come out of this crisis more resilient and more inclusive. In order to present the 
top findings of this report. In just one minute, I'm going to turn it over to Matias Busso and Hulda Messina, who are directors and editors of this report, who took on this challenge to look at the different dimensions of inequality, bringing together a diverse group of authors and who were able to manage the complex processes of, uh, public, of publishing these along with the different teams. We also got a number of comments from many colleagues at the IDB. And thank you to all of those who helped us in one way or another to get here today. And thank you to Matias and Juliana for the wonderful work they did. Before offering the floor, I would like to mention to all that the president of the IDB, after the presentation of this report, is going to talk about inequality, and he'll do that alongside Marcela Menendez, who is the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean from the UNDP, Martin Rama, who's the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank, and Alejandro Wardner, who is the Western Hemisphere Department Director at the IMF. Thank you very much for being with us. And without further ado, I turn it over to Matias and Julian, who are going to present this report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you all for being with us. My name is Matias Busso. I am one of the co-editors of this report, The Inequality Crisis, along with Julian Messina, who is going to introduce the second part of this report. The pandemic struck the region during one of the strongest uh, impacts of social unrest. And we see here what has been increasing in the region up until now with the numbers of demonstrations and strikes. And behind these demonstrations, last year in many parts of our region, there were protests that had to do with inequality. The pandemic is going to leave us in a region that ha will have higher degrees of inequality and inequality is likely to be one of the main challenges in formulating the right economic policies. Inequality when it comes to income and opportunities, once it becomes excessive, it has an impact on social cohesion. And without social cohesion, we cannot fully uphold the social contract living in a society. This is why this report, in order to understand the depth and dimensions of inequality, looks at the reasons behind these realities. This is the fruits of work carried out by a large number of people. There are 14 chapters that cover a wide variety of topics. Obviously, given a time restraints, we will not be able to go into all of the chapters. What we will do today is try to shed some light on some of the cross-cutting themes that come out of this book. This presentation will be made up of three parts. First, I will talk to you about the facts and data that we have used and what is happening with inequality within the region. Then Julian is going to talk about the root causes of high degrees of inequality and also the policy alignments that we believe countries should follow over the next decade. Inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean, as I said, is very high. And this is one of the main messages I want you to walk away with. But there are a few factors that are important to retain as well. The second message is that in addition, to having a lot of inequality. There's a lot of horizontal inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean. This inequality usually comes with a high degree of vulnerability for individuals. And lastly, that all of this leads to a perception of unfairness given the state of affairs. Inequality in Latin America is very high despite the drop that we have seen over the last few decades. This graph here shows what the income ratio is of the top 10% compared to the bottom 10% of the population. And here we see that in 2000, the top 10% earned 49 times what the bottom 10% of the population earned. This decline, the number is currently at 22. So this was a big drop. But what we can also see here is that the larger part of this drop happened before 2013. From 2013 to now, we saw a stagnation in the drop. And despite this huge drop, inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean continues to be much uh, higher than in other regions around the world. In the book, we use two groups for comparison's sake. We use OECD countries, so developed countries, and also uh, another group of countries that have a similar development level. And in all of these cases, Latin America and the Caribbean has higher inequality than the other regions. Inequality when it comes to income also fell. If we look at the 99, the bottom 99%, as Eric said, and the uh, poverty rate fell from 43 to 23%. And in the middle class, 
we saw that these changes were also significant. People being lifted out of poverty, entering the middle class. What didn't change too much was the percentage of income that is captured by the top 1% in our economies. This is about 20% and has remained stable and is much higher than what we can see in other regions around the world. This was the state of affairs when we were struck by the COVID-19 crisis. This crisis will undoubtedly continue to increase inequality and will have a short-term and long-term effect. In the short term, we know, given the work that has been done by the IDB in data collection, that approximately 70% of people living in low-income households have reported they have lost their job during the pandemic compared to 20% of high-income households. This is not surprising since one of the reasons this happens is someone's ability to work from home. And there are two reasons that explain this. One has to do with the sector where people work. Usually low-income individuals tend to hold jobs that require more interpersonal proximity. And the demand for employment in these jobs is going to remain low for some time until we leave this pandemic behind us. The second component has to do with digital. There is a huge digital divide in Latin America and the Caribbean. 50% of people in the region don't have access to the internet, most of them being poor. In addition to the short-term impact, we're going to see long-term impact, and it has to do with the accumulation of of people facing certain situations. And when it comes to education, for example, many of the children in our region aren't able to attend schools. The schools have been closed. And this is going to have an impact on dropout rates and learning. And we know, given other research work, that this is going to have an impact as well in 10 or 15 years on the labor market and the ability that these young people will have in finding a job later. These are interpersonal situations uh, have to also deal with what happens when it comes to gender, race, and ethnicity. Women in Latin America work longer hours and they earn less for every dollar earned by a man in Latin America. For example, a woman earns 87 cents to the dollar and they work more hours overall. They work perhaps fewer hours when we look at certain sectors, but they work almost three times as much as men do when it comes to the work being done in the home. There's also a major wage gap between black communities and indigenous communities. Indigenous communities in Latin America, given adjustments, earn 27% less than the rest of the population and black communities earn 17% less than the rest of the population. And something that is clear here is that during this time during which there were drops in interpersonal income inequality, these percentages remain constant. This inequality comes along with high vulnerability. 40% of households in our region have reported that they don't have enough money for shelter, which is much higher than the other groups that we looked at. And this is a percentage that has increased from 2013 to date. In addition to this structural vulnerability, there is a failure to address income shocks. And between the 20% of the poorest in Latin America and the Caribbean, only 10% has an emergency fund and savings, which is much lower than what we see in OECD countries. In addition to this, low-income individuals tend to feel a larger impact of these shocks. And a lot of this comes from the natural disaster literature out there. And this is the loss in assets given Hurricane Mitch in Honduras in 2018. And what we've seen is that in the lowest quintile of income distribution, there was an 18% loss of pre-existing assets compared to the 20% lost in the wealthiest. This would not really be as big of a problem if social safety nets in Latin America and the Caribbean were more robust and more agile in addressing these shocks. This is something that we continue to see during the COVID-19 pandemic. We see here the percentage of households that receive cash transfers 
for emergencies that many countries in the region implemented. And we see here the percentage of the population in the lower tercile of income that benefited from these uh, relief measures. And we see that this is very high. When we look at the middle class, which is also a vulnerable population that is always at risk of falling into poverty, uh, coverage of this transfer was a lot lower. And this is something that is being uh, built on. Many of these emergency transfers were uh, implemented based on pre-existing programs that are meant to deal with structural poverty and not with temporary shocks to income. And this uh, middle tercile was low, but what was even lower was the median replacement rate. There is also a lot of dissatisfaction with public services and a perceived idea of unfairness. A major percentage of people who are not happy with the quality of health care and a large percentage as well stated that their children don't have the necessary opportunities to grow and to thrive, which is much higher than what we see in these other groups. And so it is not surprising that only 15% of people today believe that income distribution is fair. This percentage has been in decline since 2013, which has coincided with the stagnation in the drop of interpersonal inequality of income and also coincides with the increase in social protests as well as the increase in households reporting to feel vulnerable. A vast majority of people in Latin America believe that income distribution is unfair. This is why one of the questions we asked in the book is why inequality is so high in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we have concluded that it has to do with three major factors. First, it has to do with a very high uh, lack of opportunities or equality in opportunities. Second, it has to do with insufficient distributions and effective distribution. And the third has to do with a social contract that we have labeled as fractured. The most disadvantaged in the region have been disadvantaged from birth. The region, as we said before, has made major strides in access to health care. But despite this, child or infant mortality is much higher for a low-income family compared to a high-income family. We also see this in education. Children from a low-income family reach their schooling years with major lags in social-emotional development, cognitive development, and language and communication. And this gap continues to widen as time goes on. In red, we see the gaps in teenagers, where sometimes there's a two-year lag when we compare low-income adolescents to high-income adolescents. And sometimes these children find themselves in the same classroom, but they have not gotten there with the same degree of education. This is something we'll discuss further. The second point we're discussing was that there is insufficient redistribution and also it is ineffective. The region spends very little in social spending as a percentage of the total government spending compared to OECD countries. And also when there is spending, the spending isn't always the most efficient. Social spending up to 30% of that spending ends up in the hands of the top 60%. And there is some spending that usually is decided on to help the poorest, but usually ends up mainly benefiting those who are not the poorest. For example, when it comes to energy subsidies, a large percentage ends up in the hands of the riches and tax subsidies like VAT subsidies and food subsidies, up to 60% can end up benefiting the richest. It doesn't mean that it doesn't reduce poverty, it rather means that it doesn't reduce poverty in the most efficient way. Now, when it comes to spending, we're not doing very well, but when it comes to revenue, we're not doing that well either. In the region, there's a lot of tax avoidance or, in, or rather evasion, but when there is tax collection, it is not very progressive. Up to 50% of what is collected 
has to do with in, with excise taxes and sales taxes, and usually they're either neutral or regressive. And so not only do they not help reduce poverty, but sometimes they could even increase it. However, in OECD countries, there is a lot more tax collection and profit taxes and other progressive measures. And though it's not surprising that in the region, there is a lot less that is redistributed than in other countries. In OECD countries, the inequality coming from the markets, once it goes through the filter of revenue and costs for the government, can reduce on average by, uh, by 40%. In Latin America, this is also the case, but at a much lower percentage. This leads us to believe that perhaps what is happening in the region is that the democracies in our region, many of which are nascent or, or fairly young, I should say, are not necessarily addressing the claim for redistribution. And in the book, we have studied what the relationship is between democracies and redistribution. The most developed democracies, as we see in the book, are those that have high degrees of redistribution. However, there is a major difference in the degrees of redistribution for the same degree of democracy when we compare countries in the region with countries from outside the region. Costa Rica, Uruguay, and Chile have a similar democracy level as France, Belgium, or Greece, but the redistribution is much lower in these Latin American countries. And so this leads us to believe that perhaps the country isn't necessarily that the problem has to do with the democratic institutions, but rather in the demand for more redistribution, which isn't su surprising since we have a fractured social contract. The social contract is the all of the tacit and non-written standards for what was agreed to between the government and the people and what people expect from their government. And this social contract in the region is fractured because middle class and the high income class, perhaps seeing that there's not great quality in public services have gone the private route for, access, for accessing the same services. But there are some less than ideal situations when it comes to security and safety, and some people have more resources to address that on their own. We also see that in education, where a significant percentage of students with more income can go to private schooling, and it's 10% in OECD countries, but in Latin America, this can be as high as 40% or more. When we look at this across similar levels of development, we still see that the percentages are much higher in Latin America compared to OECD countries. Now, of course, there is a lot of diversity in the region, many differences between countries and differences that we cannot necessarily go into the weeds uh, for during this seminar, but we do in the book. Something that really caught our attention as we worked on this book was that this privatization of a lot of these services and the fact that the middle class turns its back on these services usually leads to high degrees of segregation. In this graph here, what we show is an indicator for secondary schooling segregation, and it shows that a young person with low income has fewer opportunities of having some sort of contact with somebody from a different income level. Now, this is never a one-to-one -one ratio. In OECD countries, uh, this ratio is at 2.7, which means that high-income children tend to have more contact with low-income children. But in Latin America, what was interesting wasn't necessarily that this is a larger ratio, but rather the extent to which it's larger. The median in Latin America is 6.5 for this indicator. And we look at countries like Chile and Peru, this indicator is at 10. And this means that a low income young person in Chile or Peru pretty much has no chances of running into a, say, a high income student within schools to do their homework or to work on a project. And this talks about what happens in education, but it also talks about the social cohesion we can expect in the future when these young people reach adulthood and what happens when they have never met each other prior to that point. Segmentation, 
in Latin America can be seen in a number of different dimensions as well. It happens geographically. Here in this graph, we see the differences in income levels within countries, between provinces or between states. And these differences, as you can see here, can be quite major. If we want to understand the geographic determining factors for inequality between peoples and the differences between states, which can sometimes be quite significant in terms of income levels or the differences between cities, we don't quite find the explanation for the inequality between people. Because in rich cities, you have poor people and you in, in poor provinces, you have rich people. There is a major difference when we dig deeper between neighborhoods. In Brazil, for example, up to 12% of inequality between people can be purely explained with the differences we see in neighborhoods, which is a key factor here because it talks about a different degree of segmentation. Poor and rich people in Latin America are geographically close, but they're separated by usually invisible walls. But walls that end up determining very important factors in someone's life, like, for example, the quality of the services they'll have throughout their lifetime. Against this backdrop, it is not surprising that in the region, the degrees of trust that people have among each other are very low. Here we show the relationship between trust among people and inequality within countries. And here, the region is in a fairly negative situation where the degrees of inequality are very high and interpersonal trust are very low. And the same thing happens when we look at trust that citizens have in their institutions, in their governments, very low levels, as we see on this graph. Now, let's end by talking about this agenda to increase inclusion in the region and decrease inequality. And it is an agenda that is incomplete. It is incomplete because we have already started it. We cannot forget what progress has already been made. The region has taken major strides in access to integration and to health care for the poorest and the most disadvantaged and has worked a lot on keeping this poverty to turn into malnutrition through support programs such as conditional transfers and non-contributory pensions. But it is incomplete because these degrees of inclusion and inequality in the region continue to fall below the levels we wish to see. This new agenda for a more inclusive social contract must focus on three pillars. The first is leveling the playing field, giving everyone a fair shot. When it comes to healthcare and education, we need to focus more on quality, not just access for the services given to the poorest. But this is going to come at a cost a cost that perhaps tomorrow or we come out of this pandemic will not necessarily be within our reach. And so this will need to be a policy to be phased in, but we need to prioritize. There are some spending that we can not let go unaddressed. For example, education is one of them. And this is because that is going to have a strong impact on social cohesion and inequality in the future. And not everything that has to do with inequality and opportunities require higher spending. For example, giving everyone a fair shot in the labor market will require that there is a change of the rules and regulatory changes that don't always come with a bill. And the same thing happens with leveling the playing field when it comes to gender race and ethnicity that is also going to require for changes in social norms and we know exactly what these are we know that they are very difficult to change but the work must begin the second pillar that we have to work on is redistributing more and better in the short term we will not have a choice but to spend better and to collect better we need to change the way in which we collect revenue so that we can make it more progressive and this is something that we need to do one step at a time and also uh, improve our spending. In many cases, in the medium term, we'll have to increase spending, social spending, and for that, we'll need to increase taxes. In many, in many countries, tax revenues are very low. We need to collect taxes better in a smarter way. And finally, we need to find social insurance. In the beginning, Matias was saying that our social networks have gaps.
Uh, they leave many people very vulnerable to shocks. Perhaps they're not poor, but they are at risk of poverty. So we need to change the way we think about our y más inclusiva. Social, uh, Esto va a ser importante para la cohesión social. Y esto será importante para la cohesión social, pero también tenemos más resiliencia, mayor resiliencia cuando enfrentamos la próxima crisis. Gracias a todos. Y ahora le doy la palabra al presidente Moreno para la discusión de panel. Gracias mucho, Matías. Gracias, Julián. Para la discusión de este tema tan importante. Gracias, Julián. 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 Gracias, Thank you to all who have contributed to this uh, very important report. At this time, uh, this crossroads where we know that COVID will have a lot of consequences and as, as both speakers were saying, perhaps the worst consequences are borne by the poorest. And we're talking about now those pre-existent conditions they already existed in the region and now they are exacerbated because of the pandemic and this is a huge challenge undoubtedly not just for policy makers but for everyone uh, related to policies and the government we need to have a plan of action that is committed to inclusive growth i think this is what we need to highlight here we know that the region in 2021, 2022, there will be an electoral cycle. 13 elections in different countries will happen. And this, of course, will be one of the main topics of debate. And all of us who work at institutions such as the ones that, that we are representing today need to make this information and these facts a lot more visible. I think as our speakers who presented their report, the pandemic has really shed light on this crude reality that perhaps we were not paying attention to before. We need to understand that growth in and of itself will not resolve these issues. And these, what we see here, this is a diagnosis that has been uh, already identified by many institutions. So there will be a lot of work ahead of us for all multilateral organizations because ultimately it's our responsibility since we have the knowledge, we have the experience, we need to make it known, we need to bring it to a public debate that will inform public policy decisions uh, much more intensely. I'm lucky to have a wonderful group of panelists, Marcela Menendez, Chief Economist of the UN Development Program, Martin Rama, Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean of the World Bank, and uh, the Director for the IMF of the, for the um, Western Hemisphere. So I'd like to talk to Marcela first. These studies by UNDP, uh, has there been a before and after? When we talk about inequality and the idea of the multidimensionality of the issues, there were some excellent reports also by UNDP throughout these last few years on human development, which is a part of this as well. And we were saying that poverty is much more than income, as uh, our speakers were saying, it has to do with access to service, the quality of these services, where people live, the ability to interact with others that they enjoy. And I think this book is very interesting, also because of this concept that we don't mention enough, this segregation that exists in all of our societies. If there's something that perhaps we need to pay more attention to now during this time of lockdown, of isolation, of going back to what's essential, we need to think also that we have to try to lend a hand to our neighbors and uh, try to make sure that our societies are more equal. So what can we do to try to start breaking up putting an end to this segregation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for presenting this very timely and comprehensive report. We are at a time when one would expect that since we've seen now so clearly the reality of the 
structure of our societies, this would help generate consensus so we can create these new social contracts that we need in our region. I wish I had a magic solution to the problem of segregation, but I think the IVB report touches upon a very critical point when it mentions the way in which some segments of the of society has opted out of public services because they have access to better quality services that they can pay to a, pay for to a private company i think we need to take radical action in terms of changing incentives perhaps making private services and private education much more expensive because when one opts out one does not demand with the same vehemence that uh, public services be quality services and i think even in public spaces and investment in all these places where we need to be needs to be demanded as julian was saying it's dramatic that we don't get to know others from our society in our educational spa spaces and there has been success, some success in some latin american countries in bringing together people who normally would never interact and they bring them together in the classroom through scholarships for people who uh, deserve through who through merit deserve access and this means that we can start getting to know each other and part of the fact that we never meet means that we grow up without empathy, empathy and fearing our differences. I think this might be a very basic concept, but we still have countries that are very disconnected physically, even in terms of the roads and highways and connectivity. If we are better connected, we will not be as segregated as we are. We've talked about connecting centers of production to ports, and that's not enough. We need to connect little villages and all communities that development and exchange and interaction needs to reach all these places and of course the internet is part of this and maybe this is a good topic to discuss as well thank you very much marcela you bring up the, the core issue here which is that concept that we have laid bare a certain reality and now we need to live with it and all of us need to learn to look at each other from a different perspective and this will take us a long time and this leads me to a question i have for alejandro there's no doubt there's an agenda that's been pending for years in latin america and it's the idea that we do not have growth with equality and if there's anything that the pandemic is making necessary and this was necessary even before covid as we saw at the end of 2019 now with all these restrictions and uh, these these fiscal limitations and uh, alejandro is shining a light on that and also with the contraction of our economies what do you think countries can do to begin to travel along that road there's first a need for financing of these projects and focusing also prioritizing the expenditures that need to be made in order to start to provide relief for some of the worst effects of the pandemic go ahead please Yes, thank you very much, Luis Alberto, for uh, the invitation to be a part of this panel. The book, the report is very good. And I think this is the right time for this book. The book clearly responds to the social movements that we saw in Latin America last year, and these will grow when we come out of COVID. At the end of the day, the situation that Latin American economies will be experiencing once we've succeeded in controlling the pandemic will be worse in terms of poverty, distribution of income, fiscal capacity, all the factors that you mentioned. And there are some risks here in the short term, and this has to do with your question. Governments reacted within their uh, abilities and possibilities in quite 
an aggressive wave, about five points of the GDP, a percentage points of the GDP in many countries, even 10 points, or like Brazil and others a lot less, like Mexico, which only spent one percentage point of GDP on the pandemic. But given this uh, worry about fiscal sustainability, credit ratings, the cost of financing, there might be a uh, too rapid withdrawal from this when pa the pandemic is not yet fully controlled, but people think that this recovery that we're beginning to see will accelerate, we'll see a situation where in epidemiological terms, as well as in financial and economic terms, we're still in a situation of great uncertainty. And if this spending is withdrawn too quickly, that could be very dangerous. And so this first agreement that civil societies need to reach is precisely here in order to support this spending that doesn't need to be as high as it is this year in 2020, but it needs to be significant. There needs to be national agreements. We maintain this spending, but fiscal sustainability is anchored in measures, reform measures. Many of our countries will need to have budgets that are aggressive for next year in terms of supporting families, but at the same time, part of this spending will need to go a more traditional way in terms of demand. But addressing fiscal sustainability concerns with reforms that guarantee that starting in 2022 or 23, those uh, spending uh, excesses will be withdrawn and we will have gained efficiency in our expenditures in health and education, but especially as the study says, in uh, subsidies, in uh, expenditures that are not efficient or effective. And at the same time, we need to strengthen fiscal frameworks in order to guarantee this. I think it's a balance that can be achieved. And the second matter, more in a more medium term, is the second agreement that Latin American societies will need to reach. And this is brought up by the book, Stronger States in Terms of Social Coverage and Social Insurance and Redistribution. They will need to offer more ability for the private sector to invest and to improve the productivity of these countries. This will be a challenge for many Latin American countries. Thank you, Alejandro. You're right when you say that what we need is a major general agreement in society. We need to have the ability to be much more careful during these months still ahead of us with the pandemic. But all of this must be based on the uh, certainty that deep reforms will come about that we were unable to do before for whatever reason. I think that's where a good part of our public policy debate were focused on. I'd like to ask Martin, the study points out among other matters that there are certain effects and uh, losses of income that families suffer, that 20% that Matias was talking about, 20% at the uh, highest income level. In the lower levels, people would lose their jobs at three times the rate of those at the in the top 20%. So what kind of percentage, Martin, or what kind of measure do you think, Martin, should be implemented so that when we start growing again, it's growth that will generate a lot of jobs. This will be uh, very essential in this discussion. Thank you, Luis Alberto. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Matias, Julian, and the entire team for an excellent report. It's great to see that the team has been or is still part of our own team. Wonderful collaboration between the World Bank and the IDB on poverty, inequality, home surveys. So first, uh, congratulations to everyone. And I think your question is uh, very important. The dimension of employment, what it means in terms of inequality is enormous. And I'm glad the report emphasizes education, health, uh, transfers, money transfers, taxes. But at the end of the day, the 
employment is what really drives inclusion and equality. Uh, the World Bank had its uh, report on employment, and we did a survey of different homes in the world, not just uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, to see what transitions from poverty were associated with income changes related to jobs and which were related to changes in income due to transfers in the developing world. And this was measured on a per capita basis, either because the family is small or because more people work in the family or more transfers happen per family. And we found that 90% of transitions out of poverty were due to better jobs. And very few transitions into the middle class are due to cash transfers. This can reduce vulnerability, but you cannot expect a society where we can have in a society that we can have a solid middle class based on transfers. And this crisis has shown the importance of jobs and the divisions we have there. The report correctly emphasizes differences between gender, race, ethnicity, and, and all this in the context of jobs. But there's a huge difference as well. Those who have formal jobs and those who do not, those who have a salary and those who do not. And this has shown us that all those who did not have a contract and could have unemployment insurance, they had to leave their house because if they couldn't work, they would not eat. They were the ones who suffered the most. And this is a huge challenge for Latin America. It is rich in natural resources, but Natural resource exploitation is not very intensive, labor intensive, mining, etc. When we look at these comparisons that the report shows us between Latin America and other countries, a huge advantage is related to employment. In our case, it's much more difficult because of this lack of proper jobs. So I agree with Alejandro in the short term, the issue of how to deal with transfers, uh, cash transfers will be important. And in the medium term, the huge challenge will be how to generate inclusion through employment. How can we avoid these dual societies where some are doing well and others are feeling extremely vulnerable? Luckily, we've had some social programs, we saw it in the presentation of the book, that have been able to reach large numbers of people in the informal sector, as in the case of Brazil this year. But that's not sustainable in the long term. We can't be providing five percentage points of our GDP in cash transfers indefinitely. So the question is, what kind of measures related to infrastructure, to territorial, uh, space to the way cities are organized to um, international integration what kind of measures of this kind can help us uh, increase inclusion and one of the answers is digi digitizing our economies we'll have to do a lot more remote work electronic uh, government or e-governance and those who work in agriculture, in interpersonal services, or maybe who have no access to internet or are not qualified to have some of these jobs will be at a great disadvantage. So in the short term, I fully agree with Alejandro. We need to think about this fiscal transition in the medium term. We need to think about an agenda for generating jobs. All these um, points you bring up are very important, Martin, and I'd like to ask Marcela the following. Conditional transfer programs, as we all know, uh, exist in Mexico. They've had them for practically 30 years. We've all thinking, been thinking about this for some time. How can some families gradually move out of this? Are there subsidies that are being sent to those who don't need it necessarily, as the report shows? And there's something Martin was mentioning, and I think is it's key, and the report mentions it. It's true that 50% of Latin Americans do not have access to all the possibilities for remote work because they don't have the gear or because the cost of connectivity can be 15 or 20 percent of their income. How can we think about new types of transfers? How can we 
organize them better and change the incentive structure that we had once we start leaving the pandemic behind so that these transfers can be much more effective and help people towards this new social contract that we've been referring to. I think transfers are rescue programs. These were conceived as ways to mitigate poverty and they should be just a stopgap measure. If the rest of the support system exists, it, they should not be necessary. But if your education system, your health system doesn't quite work, then you have this issue. In the context of the pandemic, cash transfers are a rescue measure and should be transitional, should be temporary. And I think we spent a lot of time thinking about the fact that markets where there is so much informal work there, what we see is that a large number of our workers are invisible and we don't even know that they lost their jobs. In the real world, in an ideal world, we should have rescued those workers, but we only had records for transfers to the poorest, but not some of these workers who lost their livelihoods. There are a lot of people who lost their source of income. They were not in the group of the poorest and we are not reaching them. So I agree with Alejandro. I think our efforts now in cash transfers to families should continue. It's a way to maintain a minimum level of demand and to give people a way to survive. But we need to understand what it is. It's not a solution. And I hope that we can think about how our social protection systems are flawed and need to be fixed. And Julian said something that made me reflect, uh, talking about uh, labor markets, uh, maybe just regulatory changes are needed, maybe money is not needed. I disagree. I think we have social protection systems that have given privileges to certain segments of society and changing these will require achieving a certain level of con consensus. Again, a new social contract. We understand that this is not working, but some people will be losing out on something when regulations change. And so we need to all reach a new social contract. Thank you, Marcela. Martin was saying something that I thought was key. Even, um, especially our smaller economies have grown through foreign trade. There's really no other way for them to do it. Mexico, perhaps, is an example. And then we talk about value chains and how these will be rethought in the world's uh, factories are in Asia, some in Latin America. But in North America, we export five basic uh, products, energy products, uh, agricultural products, and then the rest of it is services. So how should we think about this as a region? How can we insert ourselves into this globalization trend in a more inclusive way? And how can we uh, prevent that temptation to go into protectionism in our countries? And how can we have an intelligent export substitution strategy? As we see in some countries, Mexico is a good example. They import uh, grains, but they very easily could produce them themselves. Go ahead, oh, you're muted. This is... Uh, a deeply important question. It's related to growth in Latin America. And this is because there are a few countries in Latin America that have uh, the openness. And what we've seen historically in economies, when you are more open, you generate more jobs, there's more competition, and there's more economic growth in emerging economies, probably these would lead to better distribution of income as well. In this current situation, there's the fact also that geopolitical tensions are perhaps the not 
essential in Latin America. Some are questioning the globalization process, but they're not including Latin America perhaps in this questioning. So if Latin America does things correctly, it could receive part of this, this relocation of value chains because it will be looked at as a region with a lower risk of politics in the future. And to take advantage of this, of course, we need to vastly improve our infrastructure, our regulatory frameworks. We need to generate certainty as well in these frameworks. We can't reinvent regulatory frameworks every six months according to who is in power. We need to have more state policies and fewer party policies. And many of the matters touched upon in the, in the report are related to this. You mentioned the case of Mexico. I don't know anything about the vehicle or uh, the car um, industry, but when a lot of these vehicles become electric cars, will Mexico still be able to attract in investment? Perhaps there are issues with education or a lack of human capital where this uh, segregation that the report talks about is having an effect on this. Does Mexico have what it takes to continue to have investments in the vehicle industry once we go electric? So we need to have a labor market that's much better educated, much more competitive in the future. We need to remove all these economic policy restrictions that making impossible to move factors around. I think this would make the region much more powerful and put it in a better position to take advantage of the current situation. Thank you, Alejandro. We've uh, even seen um, projections about this uh, vehicle production industry and we see a high percentage of cars will be electric and then we see for example how much is funded through taxes on gasoline so that's another transition that will need to happen so alejandro was mentioning something that i think is uh, fundamental when we think about young people in the world in general as a consequence of the pandemic there are those that will have to bear a heavy burden of the consequences, not just because of the fiscal issues we're talking about, five percentage points of GDP, as Alejandro was reminding us in many countries. What will this do to education though? What will this fact that young people are now disconnected from a future labor market, how will this affect them? So what can be done in the short term to prevent uh, these young people from uh, leaving school, from deserting their, their schools, from dropping out of schools or others? And what can we do to make it easier for them to join the labor market? What do you think about that, Martin? It's a big challenge and there are no obvious solutions, I think. An advantage is that the new generations are much more educated in general, as the report says. And there was a time when working on the internet and uh, working from home was only for services on electronic platforms. And this is something young people can do. So they're better positioned in many cases. We have social problems. Yes, we have issues with their aspirations and frustrations. Those young people who are not going to school and they're not working at the same time, that is a manifestation of a deep problem. But we have some advantages. And what there's something we're working on in our office, how short college careers, this doesn't mean we're not talking about a four or five year uh, career. We're talking about a brief period of study. This can be a stepping stone for many during this time when there will be so many changes. So again, for me, the engine behind all this is demand. We can think about how we uh, provide more education to people, but we also need motivation and energy.
las políticas. And so this makes you think that we should not only talk about how education policies or other policies can help here. We need to create job opportunities for young people and for everyone. That's key. And I think that all of the panelists have highlighted where some of these blockages are, where the roadblocks are to labor reforms, obviously in some of the systems, uh, what we end up getting is some people benefit from the reforms and others don't. When there is a an economy that is stuck at a standstill, that's what we've seen in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. With all of the changes, there will always be winners and losers. It's, always very easy to change when everyone is suffering. And so the major question is, how do we create these opportunities that make the necessary adjustments for everyone not as abundant? And how we can look at the necessary policies be implemented, even if they're not great for other regions, but they work in Latin America. How do we add value to what we have locally, how do we work in line with competition standards, how do we look at scale, how do we look at how much revenue is coming into the government. In countries where things are going well, it's still important to look at what's being done right and what's being done wrong, and that helps a competition. We know that in our economies, we're fairly small economies maybe with a few exceptions, Brazil and perhaps others, but we can always learn from what is happening in other places. We see what the USMCA has done. It was signed, but not ratified uh, between the EU and Mercosur is another treaty. All of these can come into play to increase demand and have young people have opportunities to actually seize. Thank you very much. What all of this makes you think is that part of the solution for young people will have to come from solutions that are the fruit of thinking outside of the box. Having, having for example, training programs that are coupled with some sort of a temporary status working within a business, some way to give young people a way to gain these skills that can more quickly have them in, take up a job in the labor market. And I know that doing this for a thousand, two thousand young people is a lot easier than doing it for millions, but that's a challenge. I know that when we think about Roosevelt, President Roosevelt and the thirties and what happened then, I mean, there were a number of programs that were introduced that failed. There were a number of programs that were introduced and eventually it helped to bring people back into the labor market and help the economy get back on its feet. It's all food for thought. Let me thank all of my colleagues and turn first uh, to Eric and Matias and Julian. Thank you for all of your work. And of course, thank uh, Marcella Martin and Alejandro for your incredible insight. This is a topic that we're all going to have to work on nonstop. I know that at this point, I have started the countdown for my exit from the bank. And one of the ways that I want to help what we're doing now is by improving communication in discussing public policy. I know that we cannot solve everything and especially solve it all at once, but we can talk about how to communicate better with the public, with all stakeholders, how to be more connected, how to have higher degrees of education. And I am certain that if we're able to have better communication, we can start to forge a path that can bring us out of these issues that have been challenges for our region for too long. Once again, thank you all very much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.